in this morning worshiping with us. We're honored by your being here and would love to know that you were here and we'd love to know that everybody was here. So please take that Connect card and remove it and uh, just at least put your name on there if you're a regular worshiper with us. If you're a guest with us, you can maybe put your full name and at least an email address some way we can get in touch with you. Just say thank you for worshiping with us and, uh, and answer any questions you might have about First Baptist Thompson. Um, on the other side of that, two sign-up things. The first says upward donations. So we've gone from upward devotions to upward donations. Uh, not that I'm sure Ben still couldn't use any more devotions would be willing to do that on a Saturday. But now we're preparing about that awards night, that celebration at the end of the season. And one of the ways we celebrate, make that exciting for the kids is to give away door prizes. And so if your business or you person would like to make a donation for that, just put your name there. Ben will get in touch with you. And then you'll also see the Young at Heart sign up for February the 14th for Valentine's Day, our senior adults. So we invite all of our senior adults uh, to sign up and to come and enjoy that lunch and to be a part of that and that program. We're going to have a, a theater troupe. The only Christian theater troupe in the state of Georgia is going to come and do a presentation. So it ought to be really interesting and fun and exciting. And I know that you want to be a part of that. If you look inside your um, order of worship, also want to point out, we are collecting pasta sauce for manna this month. Um, and you can bring that either up to the office, especially if it's in glass jars, we'd prefer that, or put them in the uh, blue bin down in the atrium. Uh, you'll also see that the blood mobile is coming up. And then finally, after this service is our Next Steps Luncheon. For new members or those who are interested in learning more about our church, maybe you're praying about whether God would have you and your family to unite with us, um, invite you to come. Uh, we've got plenty of food, so even if you didn't sign up, you're thinking, oh, well, I would like to stay and, and be a part of that. Please come. We're going to have plenty of food uh, to share, and would love to see you there. Again, thank you for being in worship with us today. Those of you worshiping with us online or on the radio, we welcome you as well. And we're glad to know that you're out there worshiping with us. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, thank you so much for uh, the week that we've had, Father. And I know that there have been prayers answered. I know that there have been uh, just wonderful things happening in people's lives. New jobs and opportunities have opened doors, Lord. And we know it's also been a difficult week for some, Father. And there have been news that people didn't want to hear. And there have been uh, losses of life and, and people that have, are in grief, Father. And so we both praise you for the gifts, and we also grieve and mourn with those who are struggling, and we pray your blessings upon them, God. Uh, whether it's in the good times or the bad, Father, we can always praise your name. There's always grace enough uh, to help us through whatever it is that we're experiencing, and we pray now, God, that your spirit would be with us in this time of worship, that we would truly worship you uh, in truth, that we'd worship you in honesty and sincerity and in joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, we've been given a shield of faith, and that shield of faith is our faith. It's not our faith in ourselves. It's certainly not our faith in our faith, but it is our faith in God, and God is the one we can trust. Let's stand together. We can celebrate that in song.
<laughs> our faith, like I said, is not in ourselves. Our faith is not in our faith in God. Our faith is in God and what God has said about us and who he has said that we are. And that we celebrate because we can put our faith in that. Even when Satan is telling you otherwise, you know that that's not true. So we can sing this song together. Oh, with Testament reading is from Psalms 91, 1 through 5. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. 
Our New Testament reading is 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. For this day that you have given us um, a time of a time to worship you because you deserve it, Father. Lord, through your Son Jesus Christ, that you have given us this time of of worship. Um, that we can be thankful for you and the, and the provisions that you have provided, Father. Lord, we thank you um, that in yourself we can be shielded, Lord, um, from, from Satan and his schemes. Father, we pray that you uh, continue to uh, bind up Satan, Father, in this time, Lord, as, as David uh, comes and, again, he exposes Satan for who he is, Father. Um, we pray that you shield this church as well with yourself, Father, knowing that your truth will be proclaimed. Father, we ask that you um, protect us as we leave this place and that you would give us time to share um, and to promote your name, Father. We ask all this in your Son, Jesus' holy and wonderful name. Amen. You guys can remain seated. This is a song that we haven't sung in a while. It's not a difficult song, but we haven't sung it in a while, but it does, it puts the words of the scripture reading into a context that we can easily repeat. So sing this with us, you'll pick up on it quickly if you don't remember it. Oh, shit. 
There's so many songs about our, our trust, our rest, our hope. This one is one of my favorites. Boys and girls, if you'll come down, I have a lesson for you.
Good to hear, you, hear the thundering herd coming down. <laughs> it's good to see you all. All right. Look at all these boys and girls. All right. It's good to see you. We have been covering the, the armor of God and going, uh, you know, one by one through the different pieces of armor. And today we are talking about the shield of faith. And, uh, and they all kind of connect, you know, you need one after another. You, you don't really just take one and not put on the rest of the armor. That wouldn't do any good, right? We've talked about that. Now, a very important part of armor, if you had anything, is a shield, though, okay? And I don't know about you, if I thought about a shield, especially with the Marvel Universe right now, I tend to think of this guy right here, okay? So I was playing with Caleb's toy. There's Captain America. You know, when he's running around, he has the shield kind of strapped on his back. But when he needs it, he can have it right here. Now, his shield is, is kind of different because he can move around a lot. He can block things with it. Uh, you know, so if he's protecting himself against bad guy, and he has superpowers, so he can, you know, throw it really far and, and knock out the, the Chinese spy balloons out of the sky. So uh, <laughs> Captain America, though, is, is kind of unique with his shield. It is a type of shield, but you've got to be able to move around a lot, and it's usually used... If somebody was using this for like one-on-one, -on -one, like sword fighting. In the Bible, it's talking about a specific shield that's a little bit different because it's talking about uh, groups of people coming together, a group shielding one another, and also shielding your entire body from like arrows. It, it talks a lot about like arrows and flaming arrows. If you had this, it would be kind of hard to knock down every arrow. So there was another shield uh, that armies and the Roman army would use, and it was a lot bigger. If you see... Um, about the size of, see those rectangle stained glass windows? Maybe not quite as big as one of those. Maybe not as tall, but pretty tall. You know, almost like a door that you're holding in front of you. And, and it's curved, and it can kind of protect you if arrows were coming in. Now, imagine if you had a shield like that, that can kind of cover you, and, uh, and each one of you had one of those shields. If we needed to get somewhere, and we stayed together, could we, we could do it with all those shields, couldn't we? We could kind of make a, could we make a wall of shields? I think we could. Um, we could. Something like this. So this is like a Roman army. They're just kind of, uh, they're in costumes, but showing how this would look. And the ones in front would have the shield. But even if somebody was trying to shoot arrows on top, you could hold, the ones in the middle, like in the middle of the, the group, could hold their shield above their heads. And you'd be protected, almost like a, shield umbrella. You'd be protecting everybody uh, from the shield coming, uh, from the arrows coming down. Um, and the shield of, shield of faith is connected to our belief. That, that, that we believe. Yeah. I can play baseball. You play baseball. Yeah. You've been talking to your daddy. Baseball season. All right. <laughs> uh, and the shields, we with shields like this, not only are we protected and our entire body is protected? We can actually advance and keep going. We can keep going even if someone's trying to, to stop us and just press through because there's so much that's shielded uh, with us. And that's, that's our belief in God. Not only the shield protects us, but we help other people. Maybe other people might, they, they might be doubting, uh, you know, I'm just not a good enough person. That, that's when Satan wants to attack us and say we're not good enough. And someone else can say, no, God loves you very much because who, who Jesus is. And let me show you in the Bible our lesson today. And that's using your belief and using your shield to help one another and to protect one another and to keep people going. Okay, And so the shield of faith is really important, not only for us to have, but for us as a group. And that's what your Sunday school teachers, through their teaching, your Wednesday night leaders, through their teaching and stuff, is to help press that faith and that shield to protect each one of us. Okay? Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful for all, all these boys and girls up here, and uh, Lord, that through their studies, through their uh, time together, and in their classes, and uh, here on Sunday and Wednesdays, and, and at home, Lord, that they are learning things that help build up that shield of faith for them personally, and, and for them as they share with other friends and other people, that they can uh, uh, continue that faith uh, through their own stories, through their own testimony, and through their own learning of Scripture, they can encourage one another. 
and that we can press against any any time we doubt, any time that Satan wants to say our sin is too much. Lord, we know that your your love for us is even more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, uh, you're now invited to Children's Church, twos and threes in the nursery area, and then K-4 first grade uh, will be in the chapel. All right. Thank you for that, Ben. Isn't it great to see all those boys and girls down front for this? I mean, just praise the Lord. We are so grateful for all of our, our families who bring their children and make that a priority to have their children here at church. You know, we've been looking at spiritual warfare, about the very real enemy that we are up against and his uh, spiritual forces of darkness that seek to deceive our minds and to, to deceive our hearts and seduce our hearts, to defeat our spirits, to discourage our service for God and His kingdom. And so it's vital that we know our enemy, that we can identify his strategies so we can take up that full armor of God and withstand his evil schemes. Now, our enemy is strong. He's capable of wreaking all kinds of havoc in our lives. But in Christ Jesus, we're victorious already. We stand against him already victorious because of what Jesus has done for us. And because of this amazing gift of empowerment and equipment that God has given us, this spiritual armor that's made available to every single Christian, but we have to do what with it? We have to bear the responsibility of taking it up, putting it on, and using it. He makes it available to us, but we're the ones who have to put it to work. Armor is of little benefit, as Ben was saying, if you don't take all of it, or if you leave it at home when you go into battle. You've got to take it up, put it on, and make proper use of it. And so that's what we're looking at in Ephesians chapter 6, and we're getting kind of near to the end of this. So let's go back to verse 10. I want us to read together uh, from 10 through 16. Paul says, Finally be strengthened by the Lord and by His vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything, to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, your feet sandaled with readiness of the gospel of peace, and in every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that your spirit would speak to us now, Lord. Bring conviction where we need to be convicted of our sins. Bring encouragement, Lord, to those areas that we are struggling. And we pray, Lord, that you would equip us for the week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want us to first notice here in verse 16 about Satan's scheme and the, the weapons of choice for the evil one. He loves to use these flaming arrows, these fiery darts. Now, maybe you've seen movies or documentaries where you've got a, a line of archers and they've got those flaming arrows ready to let loose on an enemy army or a village or a castle or, or something like that. This is more than just a dramatic scene in a movie. Well, I mean, this isn't. That's pretty much what that is. But this was a common tactic of Roman armies. They would use these fiery arrows because they could consume, they could destroy, and they most certainly intimidated the enemy. And so we can think of Satan's schemes, his strategy, as steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Satan wants to do with these fiery arrows. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Now that phrase comes from John chapter 10. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he is comparing himself to a shepherd. He calls himself the good shepherd who leads, feeds, and is even willing to lay down his life for his sheep. And he contrasts that with the enemy who is a thief. And so he says in John 10.10, 10, a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life 
and have it in abundance. So let's think about these three tactics of Satan this morning as we think about those fiery arrows. First, Satan is a thief who wants to steal God's word from your heart. He's a thief who wants to steal away God's word from your heart. Now, there are lots of things we could talk about this morning that Satan wants to steal from you. He wants to steal the joy of your salvation. He wants to steal from you that peace that passes understanding we sang about earlier. He wants to steal away your identity in Christ. He wants to steal the, the blessings that God wants to give you away from you so that you can't enjoy those. But there's one place in Scripture where it's specifically mentioned what the devil wants to steal. Jesus, in his parable of the sower, also called the parable of the soils, he's telling a parable in which the seed that's being scattered is the Word of God. And the Word of God is being scattered across this field, and sometimes it lands on hard soil, sometimes it's rocky, sometimes it lands in soil that is full of weeds, and other times it lands in good soil. Now, the soil in this parable is symbolic of how receptive our hearts are to the Word of God, specifically to the Gospel. And so uh, when, when the seed lands in good soil, it, it sprouts, it, it bears fruit, or it doesn't because it's landed in soil that was not conducive. And so in verse 12 of Luke chapter 8, as Jesus is, is telling this parable, he says, The seed along the path are those who have heard, heard the word of God, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Now, in this parable, Jesus is specifically talking about how Satan steals away the gospel from those who are lost, from lost people. They need to hear the word of God so they can believe and be saved. Satan doesn't want that, right? I mean, Satan doesn't want people to be saved. He doesn't want people to become disciples of Jesus, so he tries to take God's word away from them. But I think that this applies as well to Christians. Satan doesn't want us in God's word either, does he? He doesn't want us to take advantage of the power and the truthfulness of God's Word. He knows there's power in the Bible, especially as we commit it to memory. And we hide it in our hearts so that we may not sin against God, that we meditate on it day and night so that we don't stand in the way of sinners or, or sit in the seat of scoffers. He, he, wants, he doesn't want us to be interacting with God's Word. And there are at least three fiery arrows that Satan uses to do this, to keep God's Word away from us. And the first arrow is the arrow of doubt. The arrow of doubt. The first thing we ever hear out of Satan's mouth in the Bible is in the Garden of Eden when he is in the form of the serpent. And the first thing he says is meant to sow the seeds of doubt in Eve's mind about something God said. Genesis 3.1, it says, Now the serpent was the most cunning, the most crafty of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden. Now, we talked about this a few weeks ago, but Satan is cunning. He is crafty. And with that simple question, did God really say, he effectively stole God's word away from Eve's heart and replaced it with doubt, with questions about God's character, causing disbelief in God's word, which eventually led to disobedience against God's will. There's a reason that the antidote to temptation is to commit God's Word to our memory, to hide God's Word in our heart, to meditate on it day and night, because when we are cultivating our hearts to be like good soil that's receptive, that the Word can be planted in and can take root and grow and bear fruit in our lives, then it makes us less likely to be deceived by Satan. Our hearts are less likely to be seduced to sin when we are cultivating and growing the Word of God in our lives. That's why Satan does all he can to steal God's powerful, infallible Word away from us. And the first way he does that is to make us doubt it altogether. To, to, he wants us to think that God's Word is untrustworthy. That it's open to interpretation. It can mean whatever you want it to mean. He wants us to think that it's just a book written by men about God and that it's full of errors. That's what he wants us to think. Because when we believe those kinds of lies, it robs our lives of the power of God's work to transform us from the inside out and to make us more like Jesus. So he wants to make you doubt God's word so that you disregard it 
You don't want to pick it up. You don't want to listen to it being preached or taught. You just don't want it as a part of your life. Now, if he can't get you to doubt it, then the second arrow he will fire is the arrow of distractions. He'll distract you from it. Let's go back to Jesus' parable of the soils. If Satan can't steal the seed away, and it does sprout, and it does take root, and it starts to grow, then Satan will seek to steal it away by choking it out with the worries of this world. Jesus says in Mark's version of the parable, Mark 4, 19, it says, But the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So if Satan can't rob us of the seed of God's Word, he'll try to make it fruitless in our lives by keeping us distracted from it. Our our intent is is, is to read it. We believe it. We trust it. But we just don't read it. We don't pick it up. And what good is a sword if you don't pick it up and use it? What good is a Bible if all it does is sit on a shelf collecting dust all week long? I mean, how often have you thought, particularly at this time of year, right, in January, you're starting the new year, how how many of y'all have ever thought, I need to spend more time with God? I I need to have a quiet time every day. You know, I'm going to read through the Bible this year. I'm going to take that devotional that I've got, that daily devotional, I'm going to use it this year, and I'm going to read it. I'm going to actually study my Sunday school lesson before Sunday morning. (laughs) Your intentions are good because you believe the Word of God, but you miss a day, and then it's two or three days, and then it's a week. You're reading through the Bible and you get to Leviticus. I understand. Your intentions are good, but you give up. You get distracted. You get discouraged. How long does your Bible sit untouched? How long does your Bible sit untouched? Do you only pick it up on Sundays? If so, that's what Satan wants. He doesn't want you to pick up and open up this book and read it. He will distract you with all kinds of things to keep you from spending time in God's Word. But let's say you do read it. You study it. Maybe you're even a Sunday school teacher. You teach it or you preach it. Let's say that that you do that. Satan will still try to steal God's Word. If he can't get it by, by making you doubt it or distracting you from it, he will steal God's Word by keeping you from living it out. He will fire this next arrow, the arrow of disobedience. If if, if you put up that shield and you quench that arrow of doubt, you quench that arrow of distraction, he then will fire the arrow of disobedience. You may remember when we read and went through James uh, last year, this passage in James chapter 1. He says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like someone who looks at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. Listen, Satan fears a Christian who's in God's Word. But you know what he fears even more? When God's Word is in a Christian. When it takes root, when it starts to grow fruit within your life, when it starts to change you from the inside out. And so what the devil will do, if he can't, keep, if he can't make you doubt it, if he can't distract you from reading it, he's going to try to keep it at the head level. He's going to try to keep it an intellectual pursuit. He doesn't want it to penetrate and grow its roots down into your heart so that it works itself out in the way you act and speak and think. He doesn't want the Word of God to transform you more into Jesus. Now, when that happens, Satan moves on to his next tactic, his second scheme. All right? He's a thief who tries to steal God's Word away from our heart, but secondly, he's a murderer who wants to kill the fruit of the Spirit in your life. He's a murderer who wants to kill the Spirit's fruit in your life. So let's say God's Word's taking root in your life. It's producing fruit in you. And part of that fruit is what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. It's basically the character qualities of Jesus being manifest in your life. You are beginning to be like Jesus. And and it makes sense because the more time we spend with Jesus, the more we're going to begin to be like Jesus, right? We're going to begin to reflect the character qualities of Christ. 
We, we, we think like Jesus. We act like Jesus. We talk like Jesus. We have the same attitude as Christ. That, that's our goal. That's spiritual growth. That's what we want as Christians, right? So let's look at what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, where he talks about this fruit. But I want to read verses 16 through 18 first. Paul says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, we're going to skip down to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and love. The law, it's it's in self-control. Love love is in there twice. It's important, right? Self-control. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, this is one of the most beautiful, powerful descriptions of sanctification, of spiritual growth in the life of the Christian. We bear the fruit of Christ's likeness. We walk in step with God's Holy Spirit, and we enjoy living in true spiritual freedom. And that's a threat to Satan and his goals. That's a threat to his desire to steal, kill, and to destroy the work of God in the world, particularly in God's people. And so Satan's going to pull some additional flaming arrows from his quiver. And this time he's going to launch at us the fiery arrows of the temptations of the flesh. He's going to shoot the arrows of temptation. Let's skip back up to verse 19. Here in Galatians 5, he says, Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. That's Paul's way of saying, this is not an exhaustive list. I could keep on going. These are the kinds of arrows that Satan will hurl at us. And he says, I'm warning you about these things, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Jesus said that the thief comes to steal, but he also comes to kill. If Satan can't keep God's word from taking root and bearing fruit in your life, the fruit of obedience and Christ-likeness, then he's, if he can't get to the root, Satan's going to go for the fruit. He's going to do all that he can to keep your life from being fruitful for Christ. He's going to try to get you more distracted, more disobedient. He's going to try to poison the soil of your heart to the point that that fruit of Christ-likeness begins to suffer. Now, how does Satan do that? Well, let's go back to that verse in John 10.10. When Jesus says that the thief comes to steal and kill, That Greek word for kill is not the typical Greek word that you would use to mean taking someone's life. No, that Greek word that Jesus uses there is a specific kind of kill. It means to slaughter as in sacrifice. And that makes sense because Jesus is telling that in the context of this allegory about him being a good shepherd and we are his sheep and a thief comes in to steal and kill, slaughter, sacrifice those sheep. And why is that thief going to come in and steal those sheep? Not just so he can get the wool to make an ugly Christmas sweater. He's going to get that sheep to slaughter it, specifically on the altar of sacrifice. That's what you do. To sacrifice means to give up something that's precious to you. Something that's dear to you. Something that's valuable to you. So when Jesus says that the thief comes to kill, what he's saying is whatever Satan hasn't already stolen and walked away with, that you still have, whatever it is that you've hung on to that is precious and dear to you, if Satan can't steal it, he will convince you to slaughter it, to sacrifice it on the altar of self. He will try to get you to give it up on your own. Because think of it, Satan has no power over your eternal destiny as a Christian, right? He can't take away your salvation. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. He can't touch your eternal destiny. 
Jesus explains this later on in John chapter 10. He says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. So Satan cannot steal your salvation. He can't take that away. He can't steal the the fruit of the Spirit and the peace and the joy and the blessings of God in your life unless you let him. Unless you let him convince you to give them up on your own. Now you may think, well, well, how or why would anybody do that? Well, Paul talks about this in the beginning of Galatians 5, in verse 1. He says, For freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm then, and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. What what Paul is saying is that you were slaves to sin, you were slaves to the legalism of the law, and Christ has set you free, and you are free indeed, unless you willingly submit yourself again to a yoke of slavery. Satan and sin have no power over us that we don't give him that we don't submit and allow Him into our life. And God's marching orders for us as soldiers of the cross is simple. We are to stand firm and resist the devil. We are not to submit to Him again. We are to stand firm against His schemes to steal and kill God's good gifts and the Spirit's work in us. The fruit of discipleship and making disciples becoming more like Jesus, and winning more people to Jesus. That's what Satan wants to kill in you. He doesn't want you to bear the fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't want you to bear the fruit of disciples. He doesn't want you to be more like Jesus. He doesn't want you to win people to Jesus. And he will try to snuff that out in your life. But the only way he can do that is if you let him. Otherwise, he has no power over you. So he is a thief who wants to steal away God's Word from your heart. He's a murderer who wants to kill the fruit and the work of the Spirit in your life. And finally, he is a lion, a devouring lion, who wants to destroy your witness. Now, there, like, just like there are many things that Satan wants to steal from you, there's a lot of things that Satan wants to destroy in your life. He wants to destroy your family, your community, your church. He wants to destroy your body your mind? Who wants to destroy the work of God through you in this world? But ultimately what Satan wants is to devour us so that our witness for Jesus is tainted and terminated. He wants us to hide our lap under a basket. He wants to silence and discredit us so that we are powerless to win the lost to Jesus and make disciples of our neighbors and our nations. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone that he can devour. Now that word devour means to swallow up. That same Greek word is often used in the Bible to talk about drinking. It's to drink, it's to swallow, it's to consume, it's to just gulp it all up. In other words, Satan wants to make you go away. He wants to make you disappear. That's the reason the thief comes to destroy. Now, that Greek word destroy means to ruin or make wasteful. So if Satan is the devouring lion who wants to make us go away, he wants to just swallow us up, if he's the destroyer who wants to ruin us and to make our lives a waste, the enemy, another way of saying all that is the enemy wants to tarnish your testimony. He wants to ruin your reputation. He wants to make a waste of your witness. That's what he wants to do. And he flings these arrows to do it. The arrows of trial and suffering. The arrows of trials and suffering. We have to go back to our, old, to our New Testament reading and think about the context in which Peter gives us this warning about Satan, the devouring lion. So let's go back up to verse 9. He says, Casting all your cares, all your anxieties on him because he cares about you. So already we see... Peter's talking about cares, worries, anxieties, things that burden us. He says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings 
are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. What's the context of this warning to be alert and sober-minded? It's suffering. That's the context. Peter's audience were believers who were experiencing extraordinary persecutions and trials that had the potential to overwhelm them and devour their faith and destroy their witness. That's why Peter implores them to stand firm in the faith and to remember they're not alone in their suffering. There are believers suffering with them throughout the world. They share this suffering with others. Now, in James's letter, he says something similar. James is also writing to persecuted Christians. And he writes about how we should face these times of suffering and trial and difficulties. He says in James 1, 2, that we are to consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. And the way we, we consider it our joy is by remembering that what Satan intends for evil, God can use for good. We consider all joy, he goes on to say, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature, complete, lacking nothing. So how do we quench these flaming arrows of hardship and suffering and persecution and trials? Things that are meant to destroy our witness and devour our influence in the world. Well, James goes on to say that we quench them with wisdom and faith. He goes on to say in verse 5, Now if any of you lacks wisdom, wisdom about considering it all joy, wisdom about seeing the good things that God is going to do through the hard times, if you lack that wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. So how do we quench these fiery darts of the devil? With the shield of faith. We've looked at the scheme of Satan, his strategy to still kill and destroy. Now let's think about the armor of God, the shield of faith to quench those fiery darts. Paul says, in every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. There are three aspects of this shield I want us to close with today. The first is the timing of faith. It's in every situation. The timing of our faith in every situation. Whether it's good times or bad, we need to place our faith in God. Whether the seas are calm and we're experiencing the abundance of God's blessings, kind of like the disciples with that haul of miraculous fish that they're catching and bringing into the boat, whether it's those good times like that, or whether it's on the stormy seas where we feel like we're going to drown and it seems like Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat, we need to have faith in God. In the good times and the bad, in the abundance and in the scarcity, we have faith in God. Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, uses that word 11 or 27 times. And in that chapter, the author gives us person after person after person examples of people who trusted in God's providential care, God's kingdom purposes in the midst of extraordinary circumstances. They were suffering, they were persecuted, they they went without, they dealt with all kinds of hardship, and none of them ever fully realized the complete fulfillment of God's promises. Their faith shows us that trials and tragedies don't negate the promises of God. Their, 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 their lives also show us that faith doesn't keep the hardship and the trials from coming at us, does it? These are, these are the heroes of the faith, and they had difficulties. We carry the shield not to keep the arrows from flying at us, but to quench them when they do. A Roman soldier would never go into battle without his shield, especially if he knew there were archers out there. So when the fiery arrows of trials and suffering come at us, we should count it all joy by the wisdom of God's Word and faith in God's promises. And that brings us to the target of our faith. The target of our faith, the object of our faith, is in God and His Word. It's in God and His Word. I want us to think for a moment, Ben did a great job describing the Roman shields, the scutum is what they were called. And the scutum was made of two layers of laminated wood that was then wrapped in linen and then in animal hides, and it was bound around the edges with either bronze or iron to hold it all together and and to make it sturdy. 
And these shields, you know, they weren't, like you said, these little round Captain America kinds of shields. They were anywhere from four to five feet tall and two to three feet wide. And they often would have a curve to it. And the idea was if you were in battle under an assault, you could kneel down behind that shield and your whole body was covered. And you were defended from the front, you were defended from the sides. In the case of flaming arrows, often the arrow would be, would be quenched out as it thud into that hide and that linen and it would snuff out that flame as it was buried into that shield. One commentary said, During battles, these great shields would often bristle with smoking arrows like roasted porcupines. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. And that's the picture that Paul presents to us. Our enemy is launching volley after volley of blazing arrows at us. Doubts, distractions, trials, temptations to steal God's Word from our heart, to kill the fruit and work of God's Spirit in our lives, to destroy our witness. And so we put up our shield of faith. That shield of faith as we trust God, as we trust the promises of of His Word, and all those flaming arrows thud into that shield and are quenched, proving Satan's attacks are powerless and futile when we bear the shield of faith. The shield doesn't keep Satan's fiery arrows from flying at us, but it extinguishes them. Faith in God snuffs out Satan's attacks. Amen? Now, as Matt was saying, it's important for us to remember that the shield of faith isn't just some generic faith. It isn't just faith in faith. It's not just faith in ourselves. It's not faith in our past accomplishments and victories. It's not the worldly kind of faith that says, just believe and everything will be okay. That's not what it's about. No, it is about trusting in the specific promises of and truths about God we find in His Word. That's the faith. That's what extinguishes Satan's flaming arrows of doubt and distraction and temptation and trial. It's important for us to understand that this shield of faith is about knowing who God is, trusting in who God is, believing God will do what He says He will do, and having a faith that is living that out every day, trusting in Jesus. It's not just the one-time faith you put in Jesus when you were saved. It's the daily exercise of trusting in God as He walks with you and leads you step by step and day by day. It's about trusting in a faithful God who is always true to His Word, who always makes good on His promises, and who will never leave nor forsake us no matter how thick the fighting gets. We extinguish the lies of Satan with the truth of God's Word. Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, right? He faced these three powerful temptations, and He faced it with the even more powerful Word of God. Now, we'll look at this more next week when we talk about the sword of the Spirit, but it was Jesus' faith in His Father and in His Father's Word that quenched those fiery arrows of temptation that Satan hurled at Him. And that's why it's crucial for us to be in the Word and let the Word be in us. We need to know the truth about God's character. We need to know God's promises so that we can withstand those evil days that are coming. So that we can stand firm against the schemes of Satan. And there's one final aspect of this shield that we can't overlook that Ben did such a great job of talking about with the kids. And I told him, I said, I want you to focus on this. Uh, I'm just going to kind of talk about this at the end of my sermon. It's the teamwork of faith. The teamwork of faith that we are working our faith together in love. That Roman scutum was designed in such a way that they could literally lock those shields in with other people next to them to make a wall. And they could advance like a, like a human tank. They could just advance right through enemy ranks. And when those fiery arrows were being shot down upon them, they would gather up around each other and they would hold those shields over their heads, making a dome of protection so that no arrow could get to them. You know what this tells me? This tells me that we're not alone in the battle. This tells me that there's power in Christian unity and fellowship together. When we stand together, we have each other's back. We don't stab each other in the back. When we're together, we help pick each other up when we fall. We don't kick each other when we're down. 
And when we're together in faith, we can advance God's kingdom one step at a time, not leaving anybody behind. That's the picture this gives us. And Paul, Paul talks about this back in Galatians 5. He emphasizes that what matters about our faith... Look at verse 6. I don't think it's on the screen, but in verse 6, he says, what matters is faith working through love. Paul says our faith, the shield of faith, works itself through love. He goes on to say that the freedom that we have because of our faith in Jesus isn't just for ourselves alone, it's for each other. He says in Galatians 5, 13 and 14, For you are called to be free, brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Those flaming arrows of fleshly temptation, you know what they do? They isolate you from others. Because that's what sin does. Sin drives wedges between people. Sin divides. Sin makes you focused on yourself, not the people around you. But the fruit of the Spirit overcomes all that, draws us together, enables us to work out our faith together through love. That's a beautiful thing when our faith can shield each other as well as ourselves. When we come together in humility, in forgiveness, in patience, in love, Listen, when you feel like your faith is weak and you're stumbling in your faith, you can reach out to a brother or sister in Christ and they can help shield you from Satan's fiery darts. They can help shield you from the doubt and the fear. They can help you to get back up and they can restore to you your own shield of faith. You're not out there alone. We're in this together. We're a family of faith marching together, defending one another from the enemy's attacks. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 5, 4, he says that because everyone who has been born of God, everyone, everyone who's been born of God, are you born of God? Are you a born-again believer in Jesus Christ? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins to receive that amazing gift of grace so that you will have eternal and abundant life? He, is He your good shepherd? Because if He is, if you've been born of God, He says, you conquer the world. How do you do that? The victory that conquers the world is what? It's our faith. It's that shield of faith. You can go up against whatever the enemy has in your way when you have the faith that comes through having a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus this morning, I invite you to come today. Receive that helmet, that gift of salvation. And then you can take up this shield of faith, this shield of trusting and resting in the grace of God in Christ Jesus to face whatever Satan will send your way. If you have any doubts or questions about where you stand with God, I invite you to come here in just a moment and settle that today and know that you've got this faith to protect you. Christians, those of you that are saved, my challenge for us is this. When we are under attack, when it feels like we've got assaults coming and, and fiery arrows raining down on us, raise your shield. Raise that shield of faith. Spend time in God's Word. Spend time in prayer. Don't let Satan cast doubt. Don't let him distract or discourage you. Don't let him ruin your reputation and harm your testimony. Put up that shield of faith. Cry out to the Lord, and He is there with you. Maybe this morning you're a Christian, and you've been worshiping with us, and, and you've been interested in our church, and, and you need somebody you can link up your shield of faith with. You need a group of people that are going to be there with you in the battle, in the trenches. People that you know are going to be there to lift you up and encourage you when times get tough. We want to be that kind of church family for you. Maybe God would have you to link your shield of faith with ours today and you're not with our church. But the most important thing is whatever God is saying to you today, let's be obedient, not only in this hour, but in the hours to come as we go out this door and into this week. Would you stand and pray with me? Father, we are so thankful for the gift of your faith. As we read in Psalm 95, that the shield of faith, Lord, is first of all your faith, the faith that you give us, because you are faithful, you are trustworthy. You prove yourself worthy of our faith every day. 
So God, I pray you would give us that ability, that divine gift of being able to trust in you and to follow in your footsteps, Lord. God, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for the distractions and the doubts that we feed. It's not wrong to have those questions pop in our mind, but do we feed those doubts or do we quench them with faith? God, may we raise that shield of faith and, and put out all those fiery darts of Satan. If there's anyone here today that needs to put their trust in you for the first time, I pray they would come. If anybody needs to unite with this church family, Lord, I pray you would encourage them to be obedient to your Spirit's leading. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. I hope that you'll take up and put on the full armor of God every day this week. And I hope that you'll continue to work on committing to your heart and mind this passage of Scripture. Okay, We're working on memorizing this together, and I want to encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, as we go, we have an opportunity to give. And we give in faith. We give in trust. First, that God will provide for and bless us with our needs. And secondly, that God will take the gifts that we give. And you may think, I don't have much to give. But you give in faith, trusting that God can take whatever it is and He can bless it, He can multiply it, He can use it to reach so many for Christ. One of the offerings we receive throughout the years are Go and Tell Fund. And part of what it goes toward is manna. Manna is literally out there feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. It's helping those who are in distress, who are facing these times of trial and difficulty with the hope of Jesus to help them know that Christ can be there to meet the deepest needs of their soul. So as we give, as specifically as we give to the Go and Tell Fund, know that God can take and bless and multiply your gift just as Jesus did with the loaves and fishes to feed more people than you could ever imagine. So as we go, let's give. And as we go, let's go in the full armor of God carrying that banner of love. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's sing this chorus. It is so sweet. Two, three, four. Jesus, Jesus,